Okay, I've got about five minutes to go through this. Um, but really what we want to do is connect the people to the fishery. Um, you know, people want to eat local now. And how do we take advantage of that? Uh, and can we, uh, you know, is there a premium price there for eating local? Uh, if you can connect people with the fishery, if you can, uh, you know, get the stories and the history of the fishery, and also get fish to people because uh, if people should eat more fish. Uh, and then also sustainability, uh, the, you know, providing fish uh, for now and in the future. And so what I have here are a few examples of some programs that are looking at alternative marketing. So not the, you know, the typical just sending it off, uh, but, you know, different ways to get fish to people. Uh, New Hampshire Sea Grant has been working with uh, NewHampshireSeafood.com, uh, and that is connecting sort of individual uh, fishing vessels, um, you know, letting people know when the fish are coming in, when the lobsters are available. Uh, you know, here's a, a, a guide of sort of the seasonality, because seasonality is a part of these fisheries as well. You can't, you know, if you go to the grocery store, you might say, this is a fish I want today, but with, uh, you know, seasonal buying, Buying the fish when it's in season uh, is, you know, maybe looking at that and getting a higher price on that. Um, also, market your catch. This is another Sea Grant program. This is uh, out of the California Sea Grant, but it's a, a whole website. So if you're interested in getting into some of these alternative market, marketing programs, uh, this uh, market your catch site is a, a really helpful guide in that it really can explain all the steps, you know, uh, for the different uh, programs that might be available uh, from the, you know, the, the traditional marketing, uh, selling to a buyer through a processor, distributor, and then to food service or retail, and then get to the consumer. Uh, the alternatives here are either direct to consumer or uh, direct to the food service and the retail, uh, and then that can go to the consumer that way. Um, Here's probably the busiest slide you'll ever see. Um, but uh, these are, you know, this really breaks down what Market Your Catch has. So uh, these are all the alternatives uh, for alternative marketing. Off the boat, directly off the boat. Farmers markets, we just talked about that. Uh, community supported fisheries, so buying a share in someone's catch and then uh, getting that fish through the year. Seafood buying clubs, online markets, uh, having your own market, uh, selling directly to uh, retail markets or restaurants, and then institutions. And so, you know, there's lots of trade-offs with all these alternative methods. There's no simple way to do this, uh, but what the website does is break down all these different parts, costs, permits requirement, uh, required time, the number of people, and it, it helps to make an informed decision on uh, what some of these alternative uh, methods might be. Uh, just some specific examples, you know, these are not endorsements of these companies, but they're, you know, companies that are uh, connecting the uh, sort of individual docks, individual fishermen with uh, chefs. So Sea to Table is doing that. And so that's, you know, sort of fresh fish uh, direct to the chefs, you know, and you're selling that story. You know where the fish came from. You can say, this is the person who caught your fish. And uh, you know, get a, a, a higher, more premium price for that. Uh, Sitka salmon, and so there's a, a community-supported fish fishery that is uh, Alaska, Alaska salmon that is being marketed into the, uh, the Midwest. So you're buying a share of that catch uh, in Alaska, and it's coming into Wisconsin. So, you know, there is the time maybe now, you know, if we can get uh, Alaskan salmon here, and people want to buy that, why not buy even closer to home uh, with whitefish? Uh, technology, taking advantage of that. So the selling online, uh, or at least having a web presence. Uh, Oregon Sea Grant has put together a, an Oregon Catch app, and so that really helps uh, you know, to navigate uh, the sort of, you know, what the different species are, uh, you know, where the species are coming from, what you can expect for cost, uh, what you can do to, to cook that species, uh, you know, where you can buy it. And so you can really focus in on uh, those uh, fresh catch when it's available. Um, 
also social media. So uh, interacting with the customers in real time, you know, the, the, it's easy to make a Facebook page or a, a Twitter feed. It's a lot harder to stay on top of it all the time because that's, that's what it takes. And you know, some of these August, this is the, the last update from the, the Vivian May out in uh, New Hampshire. So you know, maybe not uh, uh, you know, really keeping up on that, but it's a way to uh, let people know what's fresh, what's coming in, when you can come in and get uh, different species. Um, and then uh, just some, you know, moving challenges. I think, you know, with Great Lakes species, uh, we're a, a very whitefish dominated fishery and uh, do people want to eat whitefish every day? I don't know. You know, if you go to the, the coasts, there's a lot more diversity. Um, yeah, I would eat whitefish every day. Uh, so limited species. Uh, there's also that seasonal component, you know, when the fish can be caught. Um, and then in terms of aquaculture, you know, a, a lot of the same marketing can be done. It can be used that way in selling direct uh, and meeting the demands, expanding the industry to produce more, and then sort of timing when the fish are available. So uh, that is the quick version. We've got uh, Brandon Piggott uh, from... Uh, Aquaterra, uh, Rebecca Nelson from Nelson and Paid, uh, Dennis Hickey from uh, Bailey's Harbor. Harbor Fish, <laughs> yeah, and uh, Mike LeClaire uh, from uh, Suzy Q. Uh, and so I guess we'll just uh, kind of start from the left. We've got aquaculture on this side, we've got commercial fishing on the, uh, the other side, and we'll uh, go through our uh, intros first. My name is Brandon Piggott, and uh, my brother and I, Skyler, started Aquaterra Farms. Um, well, we've been working on it for about seven years. We actually started our farm about two and a half years ago. And um, the only thing I can say at this point is if you want to make a small fortune in aquaculture is you better start with a big one <laughs> because you need it. Um, we want to do something different than what everybody else was doing, and, and so we've kind of focused on Arctic char. And um, we worked with the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, we wouldn't be where we are today without them. We had sort of a quasi public private partnership. We worked with them, and um, I think Rebecca can also attest to the quality of the, the people at Stevens Point. Um, terrific, terrific people. Uh, we came into this, we're businessmen, we had no idea about fish whatsoever, but we just had an idea. And um, I'm, on the, I'm also on the, the WAA board and a lot of the members there said, well, you're not really a true fisherman or fish farmer until you, you've killed 250,000 fish. Well, I can to a test now that I'm a true fish farmer. <laughs> so uh, we've, we've done our fair share of, of kill-offs and for a variety of reasons, and there's, you know, there's, you can go on and on about why. Lack of oxygen, switches going off when they shouldn't go off, things like that. It just, it just happens. You have to be prepared in this business for, for anything and um, have a lot of duplication of equipment. And, and even when you do all that, you, you still run into little mishaps that you end up with a tank of white bellies instead of brown tops. So, um, one of the, you know, we kind of, I'll just talk about our market a little bit. We, we chose um, our location based on what we call the Golden Triangle, which is Chicago, Milwaukee, and Madison. That was kind of like we, we focused on. And we wanted to look at a high-end fish because we felt it's going to be a little bit more expensive to grow them indoors in recirculation than, than outdoor ponds. And uh, it also gives us an ability to, you know, harvest year-round. So we've done that. Um, we're working on um, a more sustainable way of getting eggs. What we found out with Arctic char, it's not a, the most popular fish out there like rainbow trout where you can get eggs every 10 days if you want. We were getting them once a year and we had to change that formula. So we've, we've worked with some other people um, and we've been able to get more eggs more often and that, that's key to a successful um, 
harvest on a consistent basis year-round. So that's kind of like our introduction. I'll, uh, I'll pass this on to Rebecca, and then any questions at the end, we'll come back and, and, I'll, and I'll answer those. The microphone isn't working. Oh, it's not? Yes, it is. It's just for the camera. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Declare back in. Hi, I'm Rebecca Nelson with Nelson and Paid Incorporated in Montella, Wisconsin. And I'd like to start just by thanking C. Grant, Kathy, and Titus, and you guys for putting on this event. Um, I think it's really nice to get this group of people together, and the lunch was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Our company has been in existence for over 30 years, and we've focused on aquaponics for the past 20 years. So aquaponics is a little different than just fish farming in that we raise fish in tanks, and then the waste from the fish goes through a series of filter tanks and feeds plants. So essentially, we raise fish and plants in integrated systems, these systems are both sustainable from an environmental as well as an economic point of view. Our company as a whole has a, has a very broad reach in that we are growers. We demonstrate the technology at our facility in Mon Montella, Wisconsin. But the main part of our business is to help people get started in aquaponics. So we provide the training. We provide complete, patented, proven aquaponic systems. And then we provide long-term grower support. We also, as Brandon had mentioned, have a connection to UW-Stevens Point. Uh, we have a public-private partnership, and we work closely with Stevens Point. Uh, now it's, I guess we're going into our fifth year um, of together offering the first of its kind university course in aquaponics. So that course was originally came together because as a company, we had a great deal of knowledge and we were doing a lot of teaching, but there really wasn't university courses in this technology yet. So we got together with Dr. Hartlib at UWSP, launched that first course five years ago, and now we've worked every year to expand it. And at our facilities in Montello, there's our commercial demonstrations, but we also have a portion of our new greenhouse that is leased by UWSP for research in aquaponics. So we really work closely together to expand educational opportunities as well as research opportunities for the aquaponics industry to grow. To touch a little more on the aquaponic technology, um, we always have an input to our system, and that's the fish feed. Most aquaponics is done indoors in a controlled environment. So, you know, we can do it year-round. And the goal of our growers, as well as our company, is to provide food locally. And it's why it fits so well with, with this conference and then the upcoming Food Summit. It's all about providing local food to a community. We can grow a lot of food in a small space. So we can be in an urban area. We can be on the edge of town. We can be in a rural community providing fresh vegetables, fresh fish every single day of the year. So, again, I'll be happy to answer more questions, but I'll pass it on. I'm uh, Dennis Hickey, a commercial fisherman from Bailey's Harbor. Our family uh, started uh, commercial fishing in the mid-1800s when our grandfather came from Norway. And my gra uh, grandfather and his brother fished, then my father and his brother fished, and now my brother and I fished for uh, 50 years, and I, we're just in the process now of passing on our fishery to my son-in-law, Todd Stooth. Uh, we fish all types of gear that are available to the commercial fishery in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we fish, uh, Wisconsin for the commercial fishery has three different zones that you're allowed to fish in. One is from uh, the state line down by Indiana all the way up to uh, the Dora Peninsula. That's called zone three and then uh, zone two is from Bailey's Harbor uh, around to the other side. Uh, by Chambers Island, and then the south end of Green Bay is zone one. And uh, you have to have uh, quota in each different zone and uh, quota by species that you're gonna fish also for each zone. And we own uh, quota in all three zones. Uh, we, our mainstay of our fishery is a commercial fishery for whitefish. And uh, we do uh, mostly wholesale out uh, the whitefish, but uh, at times in the summer, we have a lot of tourism in Door County, so we uh, have a retail shop, and we mainly uh, use the shop three, four months in the summer, and the rest of the year uh, we wholesale uh, the fish out. Uh, I think that uh, 
there's uh, a lot of uh, talk about different species in that. Since I've been fishing in the last 50 years, we've lost about five species of fish that we uh, were dependent on uh, to uh, generate income. And a lot of times the sport fishery uh, has uh, picked up on those <coughs> species and wind up, uh, they're able to continue to fish those species. Well, we're not. Uh, I don't think a lot of people even realize, and, and I see luckily we have Mike LeClaire here, people wouldn't even think that we wouldn't be allowed to take alewife anymore. My brother and I started out fishing alewife for a cent and a quarter a pound. Uh, and uh, now uh, they're off limits to us. They use them strictly as a food fish for the trout and salmon for the sport fishery. And uh, one of the big problems we have in the commercial fishery is not necessarily marketing, but I think that uh, a lot of the effort uh, uh, with the sport uh, lobbyists and everything to uh, take away our species and keep our fishery from uh, being able to grow is a bigger problem than trying to market right now. And right now, the latest thing the sport fishery, uh, we we're down basically to just whitefish as a species that we got the whole fishery is dependent on. And right now, the sport fishery has developed a huge sport uh, ice fishing fishery for whitefish. So uh, I can see that they'll, they'll be pushing to you know, move in on uh, not allowing our quotas to be as big as they are now on whitefish. So uh, I think with that, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, maybe get some questions later, but that'll give you a little idea about our fishery. Uh, my name is Mike LeClaire from Suzy Q Fish Company in Two Rivers. Uh, I'm a fourth generation fisherman. Uh, my dad started, uh, well, my grandpa and his dad started years ago off of Two Rivers. And uh, they would fish with one boat. And my dad started uh, in the 60s, bought a trawler when the alewife, like Dennis was talking about the alewife problem. Uh, DNR asked us to find some place to go with this alewife so to help get rid of the alewife. So we started uh, trawling where you pull a net behind the boat. At that time it was 70% uh, of our uh, business. We were catching 10, 12 million pounds a year of, white, of alewife. Uh, 1992, DNR says you got to stop because we're saving them for sport fishing. So we diversified. We went into uh, trawling for smelt. We uh, started a fish market. Then we fished chubs. And now we're fishing some chubs and some uh, whitefish. We've got a very small quota into rivers because when they DNR made the quotas, they went on past performance. Uh, and when we, when everyone else was fishing for whitefish, we were fishing for alewife. So we ended up with a small quota in zone three. Uh, right now, we're, uh, our fish market, we started, as I said, in 1982 because we had a hard time selling our product. The smelt, uh, Lake Erie was catching a lot. So we bought uh, machines to clean the smelt. Uh, then we went into the smoke fish business. Started out with two small houses. Now we're up to six houses of uh, to smoke fish. We smoke a lot of uh, salmon from Chile, Atlantic salmon. Uh, a lot of salmon, wild caught sam chum salmon from Alaska. Our own whitefish that we catch, chubs that we catch. Uh, herring from Lake Superior, and you know, some other species. You got your carp, and other species, but uh, that's the biggest part of our uh, business right now is the smoking end of it. Fishing seems to be going, like Dennis said, down, down, and down because there's in our regulations. Like I said, we've got a small quota. Uh, I don't know what the future is going to bring, but uh, with the farm, with the aquaculture and uh, raising fish, 
I think the salmon is going to be the up and coming thing that all, you, all they can do is, you know, fi- uh, I should say, ac- the aquaculture part of fish farms. Uh, right now, we've got uh, doing some research for USGS with the chubs. Uh, they we catch chubs in our trawl. They gut the chubs, take the eggs out in the sperm, and mix them together, and send them up to a uh, hatchery in Lake Ontario. Last year, they t- took over one million eggs uh, to hatch off our two boats. So they this year they're trying it again. They had a very good uh, recovery or whatever you want to call it in that. So they want to do it again. Uh, but like I say, that's about all we got left is a little research and a couple whitefish to catch. All right, so now we have time uh, to really open it up to the audience. Uh, you know, what do you want to know about aquaculture or commercial fishing? What are your questions? Fred. Dennis, uh, are you involved in the uh, Yellowstone Lake? Like trout removal? Yes. Could you, could you just briefly talk about that a bit? Because it's not a commercial fishery, it's not aquaculture, it's actually a commercial fisherman helping a conservation effort, which is pretty unique. Well, actually, if you'd like, I have my son in law here, and he can, <laughs> uh, and also uh, one of the captains that uh, probably caught more lake trout than anybody in the U.S. this year. Uh, they could uh, tell you in detail about this if you'd like, if you're interested. Well, it's up to the moderate, the, our leader here. Sure. I, I just think it's, I think it's unique because uh, you're a commercial fisherman. And you guys, you know, explain what you do. You're doing it for a living. Yet at the same time, you're willing to use your skills and resources to go to another part of the U.S. and help with a really important conservation effort. I mean, somehow. We don't know for sure, but lake trout got into Yellowstone Lake, and uh, they're a big threat to the cutthroat trout there, and they have to be controlled in some way. And I think uh, after maybe deciding on about 50 different ideas on how to do that, uh, calling Dennis Hickey and having his crew go to Yellowstone was the best, well, the best approach. Well, uh, my brother and I originally started uh, further west. Uh, we were asked to, to go out to Lake Pend uh in Idaho, and uh, we did, and uh, uh, we actually, uh, I think, uh, uh, you never totally uh, get the trout out of there, but we did restore the uh, cut thro- or the uh, sockeye, or kokanee salmon okay. to uh, uh, Lake Pend Oreille. And after that, then we had calls from uh, quite a few uh, different uh, uh, agencies and everything that come and do the same thing. But as far as Yellowstone Lake now, uh, since my brother retired and, and I've uh, uh, tried to back off, uh, these fellows have taken over and they've expanded our uh, uh, assessment fishing and, and uh, research part of it uh, considerably. But if you wanted uh, to hear about that and everything, I've got uh, two guys here that, that are, are working on it right now. You know, so you wanna Basically, the, the end of the deal is we took all the commercial fishing technology and we applied it to meet research needs. And I mean, we, we work with about 11 different agencies cooperatively to help manage various fish stocks, help assess different fish stocks. And, you know, with the trend downward in commercial fishing, we had to find another revenue generation. And that seemed to work and, and definitely helping out in a lot of different ecosystems to provide the balance. And I think the biggest thing is in the western part of the country, the general public was polled and over 51% of the general population agreed that they wanted to restore native ecosystems to what they previously were or to provide as much balance as they could. And that's where the pressure has been on now on a lot of the different government agencies to restore that balance. So and that's where we stepped in. I mean, we, I think we're in about 11 different lakes right now. We have boats in uh, five states. So. I'll just comment on that. I, I learned about that recently. Dennis told me about, about the Yellowstone Lake Project, and I thought that was just such a, an interesting story that here we are. We've been trying to restore lake trout to Lake Michigan, but uh, go out to Yellowstone Lake, and they're trying to get rid of it. And our Wisconsin commercial fishermen are helping them do it because you guys know lake trout. Um, but I also think it's interesting that, um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot about how the, the, the food system
said that Lake Michigan is very different than probably Dennis and Mike when you started fishing. Um, the fish are eating different things. There's different things in Lake Michigan. The whitefish, are, it sounds like, are trying really hard. They're being re pretty resourceful and finding different things to eat. I'd kind of equate it to you guys. You're finding other things to do to keep your business going. Um, it's, it's a really interesting story. It's, it's something I think people should know more about. You may have just answered my question, but uh, there's a push for increased demand, eat more fish, but then we're hearing stories about how Lake Michigan can't produce the quantity of fish. Is it time for the state to step in and uh, help that process, or what's the answer? Eat more fish, but you're not producing fish. Well, right now, we can produce uh, whitefish. Uh, we could produce lake trout, uh, but that's the DNR has been trying to get those back in Lake Michigan for 50 years. I think they've totally accomplished uh, getting lake trout restored in Lake Michigan again, uh, as far as I know, in our zone anyway. Uh, there's no problem catching them if you go where they're at. Uh, we've done a study with USGS and we've found that there are quite a few uh, naturally reproduced lake trout already. We've shown this to the DNR and they say, well, that's not enough. So we asked them, well, what, what is enough? How many lake trout do you have to have in the lake? Well, we don't know. When are you going to know? We don't know. <laughs> so. There's fish out there you can produce, uh, but like I said, they, the problem with, uh, it seems like Wisconsin DNR, they have to, uh, it's in the state statutes, they have to keep a viable commercial fishery, yet have a sport fishery. So what's, what's a viable commercial fishery? It used to be in the late 70s, we had 250 commercial fishermen. I think we're down to about 30 now. How about uh, from the, the aquaculture side? Where can, uh, how can you, uh, you know, build that production? And is, the, is the capacity there in Wisconsin? Well, certainly. Certainly, um, you can, you, the world is going to be moving towards aquaculture. It already is. Um, we've, we've exceeded um, consumption of wild caught at this point, and or people are eating more farm fish in the world than ever before, and more than white caught, um, wild caught, excuse me. So that is happening as we're speaking, and as the uh, demand for fish grows, as middle classes rise throughout the world, and that's happening, the demand for protein, and, and most of that will be come from, from fish. Um, people overseas eat a lot more fish than we do in this country. So that's, you know, what's one of the key demands. And so farm fish is, it has to fill the gap. There's, there's no alternative. Um, the wild caught population is, is dropping. There's countries like China that's just taking a lot more than they're supposed to. Um, they actually admitted to that they took 50% more of their lobbying than they should have last year. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to keep growing and um, people will start, uh, the farm fish uh, sort of bad taste, if you will, uh, will go away because most of the people will be getting farm fish. There's people that think they're getting wild caught now and they're getting farm fish anyway. It's just the na nature of the beast. And uh, there was a there was a fisherman, a, while, a, a commercial fisherman up in Bayfield that had a sticker on his truck that said, friends don't let friends eat farm fish. And um, he was actually processing some of our fish before we opened our own facility. And um, he took the bumper sticker off his truck. So um, there's good quality farm fish and there's not so good quality farm fish. It really depends on how you do it and, and your commitment to putting out a very good product. I hope that answers the question. 
I definitely agree that fish farming is, is the future of, of seafood. There will always be wild-caught fisheries, and I'm so happy they're there. But if you look at the need for seafood and the, the need for protein around the planet, fish farming is, is, is a must. Now, a lot of the, the roadblocks in our country related to fish farm are regulatory. So when you look at innovative approaches that don't have discharge, don't have waste, like in aquaponics, we're using the fish waste to grow plants. So we're actually getting a whole other crop by utilizing that fish waste, at the same time eliminating any discharge from our system. So, you know, looking at, at the big picture impact of what a fish farm can be and how it can be innovative and, and environmentally friendly, as opposed to a lot of the bad reputation that fish farming has, um, you know, there's, there's amazing options out there to raise fish in an, in an environmentally sustainable way. Um, and in aquaponics, then you're adding this whole other product of, of plant production as well. I I can't resist this. I gotta. I gotta add uh, from the commercial fishery uh, an angle on this. We've got a situation over on Green Bay going on right now. We had probably 25 years ago they took walleyes off the commercial list, and they used federal monies to plant uh, uh, walleye. And then when they took those uh, federal monies, they it was to rehabilitate the commercial fishery. And I can remember a lot of the guys, uh, the old time fishermen, most of them are gone now, said if they ever take them off, you'll never see them again. And uh, that's basically what's happened up until now. The sport fishery has taken over on the walleyes. It's like unbelievable uh, the amount of walleyes you have out on Green Bay right now. Every spring they go up the Fox River and everybody plays with them and they catch big fish, big walleyes, they take pictures and throw them overboard. And they go right back out and what do they do? They eat our perch. And everybody's wondering, where did all the perch go? We have good hatches every year. And yet, they never grow up. By the end of the year, they can't find them. Our bio, uh, DNR biologists, same thing. They say, well, they aren't growing up. Well, it's, it's not too hard to figure out where they're going when you lift the trap net over there. You'll have a thousand pounds of big walleyes in there. You've got to shovel out of there every day in each net. We're, we're handling thousands of pounds of walleyes. They could very well be, nobody says you got to fish out the walleyes now, but they should be put back on the commercial list. And from what I've heard here, there's, there's people looking for walleyes pretty good right now, and Lent coming up, they'll be looking for walleyes. And that's part of our problem in the commercial fishery. Uh, we've got sport interests, sport lobbies. They have their walleyes for tomorrow, their big tournaments, and they're patting all the DNR guys on the back said, you're doing a great job. You got the bay full of walleyes. But the walleyes are, and we know from this last year, I, I paid more attention to taking uh, stomach analysis on the walleyes. They're, they're eating the whitefish too. So uh, they're going to eat up the whitefish. And then the DNR is proud they planted 10,000 spotted muskie again this year. And what do muskies eat? They eat ciscos. And what are ciscos? That's whitefish. So, they're going to eat up our whitefish. The sportsmen are bearing down on the whitefish uh, with ice fishing. And uh, pretty soon, our last species is going to be gone. And they talk about the economic impact of the sport fishery all the time. Well, if you take all the, the fish away from one person and give them to another, how can the other guy have an economic impact? And the fish-eating public, the people who want the fish, have to uh, help us you know, go to the DNR and say, hey, we deserve our share of this lake, too. Discussion here. My question is for the gentleman from the island. I can't see your name. Oh, Aquatero? Yeah. Um, based on this business, what do you know now that you've been in this for so many years, doing it for five years and ten years doing it? What do you know now that you wish you knew? Not just a general thing, but like really like something you face, business problems, things that you know. Uh, probably one of the key elements that affects us is the water quality. And we were blessed in southeast Wisconsin with a lot of iron in our water. And uh, we, we, we put in a filtration system that didn't do what it was supposed to do. And it causes a lot of problems. And we just put in another one. I mean, these are filter systems that cost thirty thousand dollars. So it's you know it's no small chunk of change. And we finally got one that looks like it's doing 
what it's supposed to do and our water is pristine. So um, all I can tell you is probably the biggest focus I would look at if you're thinking about starting it is your water quality. And make sure you, you know, you, for your species of fish, you, you've got the right uh, chemistry in the water. I'll address that from, from my point of view with aquaponics, but maybe Brandon can touch on it related to aqu aquaculture. Um, we, there really isn't a regulation that affects the quality of our fish. In our case, that's completely self-policed. Um, you know, we, we raise fish that, that don't have growth hormones. There's no antibiotics. We raise them in clear water with a very high-quality feed. And that's what makes our end product completely different than the imported fish. So that's self-regulated. Um, typically, the regulations that, that our customers and ourselves deal with have to do with things like building permits and electrical permits when you're starting up. Um, now, in aquaculture, where you're raising fish outdoors, um, in, in natural waterways, you're dealing with things related to the DNR. So the quality of the end product isn't where the regulatory hurdles are in any way. Uh, that's up to the, the individual culturalist. Um, the, the Wisconsin Aquaculture Association has actually been working hard to present a bill that would ease the regulation in getting into aquaculture. And I think, Brandon, maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Um. As, as far as the regulations go, that, that I, I think there's, there's two different fish farms in Wisconsin, and one is more regulated because they send um, their effluents downstream, where we recycle everything, and we're also in the aquaponics. Um, but we, we reuse our water. We, we have very expensive filtration to put it through. So we don't fall into the regulations that are happening with um, the people that make bait fish and things like that. It's outdoor ponds that basically you cut in from a river, it goes through your ponds, and it goes out back into the river. So you're washing everything downstream. That's where the regulations are coming in and affecting those people. Um, we have, our regulation is we have a, a veterinarian that comes to us once a year, looks at our fish, um, takes a portion of it, dissects them, make sure everything is, is the way it's supposed to be, and we get a, we get a clean health certificate for one year. Um, it's in our best interest, especially on an indoor recirculation system, to keep the fish healthy. Because if you don't, they are, it's, it's, you know, you, you're on a very balanced, kind of a knife edge. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're going to lose a lot of fish, and there goes your investment. So it's really in your best interest to keep the fish healthy and happy. A help, happy fish is a healthy fish. And there's so many things that can make a fish go the other way, it's amazing. But um, so anyway, it's, as Rebecca said, it's a lot of self-policing, it's you know, self-preservation. If you don't do it right, you're done. And, um, and then we also have the, veg the state veterinarian come in and check us every, every year. So. Um, we look at that. Also, our food is, is, is inspected by the FDA. So that part of it, and we spend a lot of money, our basic expenses on food and uh, high-quality food. So that's, you know, how we do it. Um, the other fish farmers, I think, are more impacted by the rules and regulations I stated earlier. It doesn't really affect us. In the back there. Can I add? <laughs> Wisconsin do aquaculture and 
one of the biggest issues we do run into are hurdles with some of the regulatory issues. It's mainly related to effluent, uh, mainly phosphorus loads and uh, nitrogen loads. Uh, what we run into is that uh, aquaculture is placed in a whole different category than any other agricultural product. So if you want to have a chicken farm or a cow farm or anything like that, a pig farm, you are regulated by <coughs> the Department of Ag, but aquaculture is regulated by the Department uh, by the Department of Natural Resources because of the water requirement. But aquaculture is agriculture, and there's uh, legislation right now that's that's in uh, the talks with the uh, legislators to get that designation changed so that aquaculture will become regulated by agricultural entities like USDA because it still is raising products just like anything else. It it's, shouldn't be held way up here at this regard. So the biggest problem is that they're kind of placed on a pedestal and every case, every time you try to come in and build a facility, it's looked at on a case by case basis. There's no standards. There's nothing up front that says if you want to come to Wisconsin and build an aquaculture facility, this is the standards you have to meet. It's a case by case basis and often that case is you tell us what you're going to do and we'll tell you if we're going to let you do it. And there's no business in the country that's going to come into a state that does that because they want to know up front where we're at. And so that's probably the biggest hurdle. I think Rebecca answered it very nicely that it's not the, the product, the quality of the product is high, but we're regulated by uh, these permits like effluent permits and things that it's from a whole different perspective. Um, the bill that's in place right now that they're looking at uh, getting passed will, will change that. It doesn't give aquaculture a free pass. It doesn't mean that you know, you're gonna be able to just go build a farm anywhere or do anything anywhere. It's, there's still gonna be regulations involved with that. And so it's just kind of making things a little bit easier so that if you wanna do aquaculture in the state of Wisconsin, you can. Because we have companies that would like to. And we have companies trying to and they can't really deal with the permitting requirements, so they're ending up going to other states like Iowa or Ohio or somewhere else where there's a little less stringent regulation. But um, I don't. that's just something that's kind of new, hot off the presses, and it's happening. And you may hear about it, you may see it in the papers. There's um, some groups out there saying that this means no regulations for aquaculture, this means there's going to be a farm everywhere and they're going to ruin your water quality and that's pretty far from the truth. Um, most of these folks that own these farms and these businesses care about the environment. Most of them are uh, sometimes second, third generation farms. They raise their kids there, they're drinking the water, so they take good care of it. And we are blessed with great water in Wisconsin and we can raise fish in Wisconsin and we can still protect it and be sustainable. And that's kind of what the new aquaculture movement is all about. Because um, we need to provide fish to everybody or else, just like the wild fisheries, if that disappears and we also don't have aquaculture, then we aren't going to be eating any fish from locally produced areas. So uh, we're going to be importing everything from China. And that's not good. You want to go? Okay, I'm just wondering uh, if there's some way that we can help educate the consumers about the fact, like for instance, most people that are eating their cod fish fries have no idea the overfishing of cod and how old they need to be to mature to, you know, sexually reproduce and how humongous cod used to be and now how small they are. Also things like uh, farm-raised salmon in Alaska that's doing a lot of interbreeding and not coming out as well. So is there enough uh, consumer education, same about walleye, you know, that if people knew what was going on with some of these products, maybe they would make wiser choices. And the contaminated fish from Japan, let's not miss that one. I would say it's really all about supporting local farms and local fisheries. Uh, Putting the word out, letting everybody you know. Events like this are great. The local food summit uh, over the next couple of days, those are the kind of the 
kind of events that start to educate people. But if you're not supporting your local food system, none of those things will happen. I mean, it's all about supporting local farms, going to the farmer's markets, telling people about the products that you know that are farmed locally, whether it's fish or fish and vegetables, fish that are caught locally, um, you know, even regular farms. It's, it's just all about supporting those local food systems as far as the education. Um, if you don't put your dollars there in your local food system, then they'll go away. It'll just disappear. Uh, and then we'll have, like, like Greg said, everything coming in from China. Uh, when you look at the quality or, or the lack of the quality in the, the seafood that comes from overseas, it's terrible. I would never, ever eat a fish brought into the United States. If it wasn't farmed here or caught here, I don't eat it. And it, it, it just comes back to, you know, the quality of, of the inputs uh, to get that end product. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just add something quickly to that. I'm of a different generation, but I see everything happening on social media. And I really think there should be a whole campaign in the social media, because that you can do bursts and you get it out to people very inexpensively. And I think the educational process could happen through that. And, um, and, and literally, I mean, you could, you know, apps and all kinds of things that could happen through social media that, you know, give our younger generation an idea of what they're actually eating, what they should be eating, and what to look for. Because it is an educational process. There's no question about that. <laughs> I had a question about the Aqua Advantage salmon that was uh, pretty recently uh, passed through, which is the, the genetically modified salmon, which is the first genetically modified living organism uh, to be uh, put forward and approved by the FDA. How does that uh, impact Wisconsin's uh, aquaponic or, or, or fish farming culture in future? Does it? I don't think it does. Yeah. I really don't think it does. Um, you know, people are going to have to make a decision on, I mean, you have a lot of people that won't eat GMO grains. Um, some of these companies are getting long-term uh, liability insurance because they don't really know what the impact, long-term impact on the human being is. And I guess it's the same thing about GMO fish. What is the long-term impact? We have no clue. It may be nothing, or we could have gills in 50 years. So who knows, <laughs> you know? So uh, it's hard to say. But I don't see it impacting Wisconsin aquaculture at all. Sure. I was going to say that yeah. the year 2000, I did a at the Midwest Fish and Wildlife Workshop it was back in 2000 in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I did a symposium on environmental strategies for aquaculture. And I had that guy, Elliot Andes, that was working on that GMO fish back then. That's how long it took him to get where we are now. And this guy, life is actually threatened all the time by these environmentalists. He had a travel kind of incognito. I was kind of running away from him every time I see him. He'd be interested to <laughs> get far away. But, but what they were doing, they were splicing a gene from a, an Atlantic ocean fish that could live in that cold water, make it grow faster, and they would put in the Atlantic salmon. And it's basically, they just make the crosses a lot faster. They get that gene in there. And it's amazing, you're growing a fish more efficiently with less food and it's getting like twice the size very quickly. But again, they're looking at containing it so it's not gonna be a staple or anything like that. But most people aren't aware of it. Probably about 80% of the food when you go to the grocery store, you're already buying GMO products. I mean, I work for Michigan State University. We're big in agriculture research, big land grant school. That's what they do. We were firebombed by elk. Ten years ago, New Year's Eve, burned one of our buildings down. I mean, but a lot of our land grant schools are doing this stuff because we work with these underdeveloped countries that can grow these crops in these very arid regions to sustain these populations so they don't starve to death. So, you know, it's a balance what you're doing with this stuff. Great. I'd like to thank our uh, producer panel for. Uh